and welcome to our second Medicine Sessions live stream. For those of you that missed last Sunday's event, we were joined by the international speaker, writer and change maker, Matt McCartney. It's safe to say he shared a pretty incredible and inspiring take on his vision of the invisible path. Um, for any of you that did miss that, you can catch it on our Facebook page or our YouTube. Now, our intention for these sessions has been to provide, you know, uplifting and, and thought-provoking content primarily. We've got a bunch of our favorite musicians and speakers uh, and practitioners to come on. But when we asked you guys directly on our Facebook page, one of the biggest things you guys wanted to know about was how to maintain your health given the coronavirus, um, anything you can do to raise our immune system or prevent it. Uh, and we heard you. So we put on this uh, special Thursday session for you guys, which is focused on just that. It's gonna be looking at how we can raise our immunity in the face of COVID-19. The current pandemic has certainly reached deep into our daily lives and affected absolutely everything. And it's given us a lot of time to reflect on how we maintain our personal health and well-being. So we are really excited to bring to you three of the greatest experts in this field. Um, hosting today's session is Josh. Josh is one of the co-founders of Medicine Festival and also a part of the core council. Uh, he's also a filmmaker or rather documentary maker and he is also the custodian of the land that we'll be doing the gathering on. So welcome Josh. Thanks Zach, uh, great to be here and um, yeah really exciting actually with the second webinar um, and I guess uh, Medicine Festival really is uh, to bringing another another definition to, to medicine. Um, and I would say that what we're trying to do really is to look at the holistic forms of all the things that can benefit um, our, our own personal selves, our friendships, our community bonds, um, and you know, potentially beyond national um, boundaries and international and so it's a it's a sort of broad idea of what medicine actually is but uh, underpinning it all is this connection to nature um, and you know we've taken you know so many years um, you know thousands of years really thinking that we are separate from nature and, and medicine festival is all about you know rethinking that really that we're actually connected to nature and not separate from it at all um, and so the experience of medicine in itself is all about, you know, music and dancing and, um, you know, connection to our friends, but also a spiritual connection as well. And, and you know, a, 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 a maybe a, a slightly deeper perspective on, you know, why we're here and the state of the state of, of, of where we are and, and what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, now, obviously, that covers a broad church. There are many different things that we can look at. But uh, tonight, um, specifically, especially in the face of Corona, uh, we thought that we would have a, a discussion on how we personally can strengthen our immune systems, which is actually, you know, a very sort of, you know, accurate description of you know, what we've always been led to believe medicine actually is. Uh, and so we've got some fantastic people on board to talk about this at a time when governments are starting to think about you know how they end the lock the lockdown um, and we're in the situation whereby you know we've, we've we've tried to protect ourselves from this virus but the economies are starting to struggle and governments are thinking you know we can't continue with this for too much longer so the question then will be you know when we start to come out of lockdown and the virus is still here how can we maintain this immunity how can we keep our immunity strong uh, and I think it's really relevant because until there's a vaccine, which may be six months, maybe 12 months, maybe maybe longer, um, you know, we aren't going to be protected from this from this virus uh, unless we we you know, we are able to uh, improve our immunity. Uh, and there are many different ways of doing that. So tonight we've got Patrick Holford, uh, who's one of the leading, uh, I would say, one of the leading global authorities on nutrition uh, anywhere. And he has written 37 books and is a passionate advocate of um, of, of certainly 
um, you know, good nutrition leading to good mental health. And he's particularly interested in the global and national medical response to corona uh, and has, uh, I think, been pushing for a different approach in how we prevent the virus from taking hold. We also have Charlotte Pulver, who is a complementary health practitioner uh, who's been working in that space for over 20 years. And um, she's recently developed an initiative to bring immune boosting supplements to key workers in the NHS. Uh, at her website, www.nhsimmunesupport.com, which we'll be hearing about later. Uh, and finally, we've got Dr. Claire Relton, who is an honorary research fellow at the University of Sheffield, specializing in clinical trials. Uh, and she's particularly interested in how holistic medicine can potentially have significant ef effects in improving, the, in improving the health of our population. So really excited to welcome you all to uh, uh, what I would term a medicinar. Uh, and I would like to turn to Patrick first, who can uh, potentially possibly give us an idea of the landscape um, and, the, and the context upon which we find ourselves in at the moment. Thank you, Josh. I think the first point to make is if you look at the 19th and 20th century, there were actually 14 um, uh, viral epidemics that killed in the thousands. And if you look in the 21st century, in 20 years, we've already had 11. I'm talking about Ebola and MERS and SARS and swine flu and and now we have uh, COVID-19. So none of these, by the way, have been sold by vaccines, none. Uh, Ebola vaccine is still running through safety trials. It's still got problems and that's five years later. So it's, it's a, bit of a, a bit of a tall order to think that suddenly there's going to be um, a safe vaccine. And by the way, we've got to have placebo controlled trials on vaccines. We cannot ask for anything less. It's terribly important. So I would say that vaccines are a reactive approach. In other words, you can only develop one once the, the, you know, the virus has come along. And uh, actually what we need is a different approach because to be honest, I can guarantee you, I would bet you know, thousands of pounds that in our lifetime, we're gonna have others. And by the time COVID-19 you know, has sort of worn away, there'll be something else, COVID-22. Actually, some of the Chinese researchers I'm working with now are pretty certain that the virus already mutated, that what they saw happening at the beginning of their COVID-19 in, in, in January is not happening now. So viruses do change. And what that means is we need a different approach. And the approach really is, is, to, is to boost the body's immune system. I have a campaign here. You see my T-shirt? Whoops, where do I go? Somewhere like here. Here we go. C4 UK, protect the NHS. And this gentleman here, let's get into the actual presentation. How is that? Is that working? Is that working? Can you see the screen? Um, okay, so uh, this gentleman here is Linus Pauling. Uh, what an extraordinary man. He is the father of modern chemistry. He is the father of molecular biology. He is the first man to work out how a gene could cause disease and how the environment would affect genetic expression, which is epigenetics. An absolute uh, master of a man who I met uh, in my 20s, and he became the founder of the Institute for Optimum Nutrition. And my book, Flu Fighters, is dedicated to him. And I would just like to read this dedication. Uh, this book is dedicated to the memory, intelligence, and humanity of Dr. Linus Pauling, 1901 to 1994. So he lived to 93 years old. One of the greatest scientific minds of all time, who Albert Einstein called a real genius, the only person ever to win two unshared Nobel Prizes. Linus Pauling dedicated and 48 PhDs, by the way. Uh, Linus Pauling dedicated the last 39 years of his life to the science of nutrition and vitamin C and suffered 39 years of unfounded abuse and denigration and continues to do so from the ill-informed, ill-advised, poorly educated medical pharmaceutical community who in so doing have deprived humanity of one of the most extraordinary, cheap and non-toxic medicines this has to stop. We're talking about boosting the immune system. Uh, you make your original immune cells in the bone marrow. And uh, then those original immune cells are taken to the thymus, which you're seeing here in the, in the base of the throat. And there they get trained up into things like B cells, which make antibodies, uh, which attack, for example, a virus or T cells or macrophages. And uh, this, for example, is a macrophage. Uh, about to gobble up some bacteria. And you are making 2,000 immune cells every single second. That's what's happening. 
And if we look specifically at the uh, at the SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 virus, it's got spikes on it. The first spike is called hemagglutinin. And this is how the virus gets inside your cells, because it has to get inside and deliver its code, its RNA, to get your cells to make more viruses. That is blocked by black elderberry. Then we have these other spikes called neuramidase, and that's how a virus gets out of cells. And you might have heard of drugs like Tamiflu, which is a neuramidase inhibitor, and actually vitamin C also is a neuramidase inhibitor. Then along come your T cells, which attack the virus, and macrophages, which attack the virus. And actually, they are boosted. Their number and their function is boosted by vitamin C, by zinc, and vitamin D. And what happens is you start to get a war. Both viruses and our immune cells produce oxidants, uh, almost like bullets. These are, you know, think of it like bleach. They're sort of harmful substances. And uh, selenium and vitamin C help our own immune cells to reload and also help to uh, deal with the oxidation. Uh, we'll see that vitamin C is an antioxidant. And meanwhile, when one of your cells has been infected, it produces interferon. So this is a substance that we make. It's actually now produced as a medicine. You can get injections of interferon. And it literally, uh, 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 that's what cells do when they've been infected, to interfere with the virus's ability to function. It's boosted by vitamin C. So nutrition is involved everywhere. And something that's very specific for the COVID-19 is it attacks hemoglobin. And your red blood cells contain this beautiful thing called hemoglobin, which carries oxygen. All of life, really, all of health, all of nutrition and disease is a balance between our ability to use oxygen and uh, the harmful effects of oxidants. And that's why we ultimately age and die. And what happens is that the COVID-19 virus uh, in infects hemoglobin, knocks out the iron and the heme, and it takes over like a Trojan horse and then can move around the body and infect other cells. And that free iron uh, becomes oxidizing. Think of rust. So you start to get a massive oxidation process which uses up vitamin C. And in the final stages, uh, which is causing the death of people uh, with COVID-19, what's happening is people are literally running out of vitamin C. Uh, here's an article, Doctor, your septic patients have scurvy, because really that's what we're dealing with, sepsis, at the end of this process. By the way, the major cause of death in people who have scurvy is, in fact, pneumonia, which is also what's happening here. And in this chart, this was a study of 47 people in this process, and their blood level of vitamin C was 14 on average. Some had no detectable vitamin C. That is below the level of scurvy. Uh, normally, your vitamin C level should be between 40 and 60 nanomoles per liter. Now, what really got Linus Pauling very interested is us humans, we don't make vitamin C. Um, there, are, there are, oops, I don't think that animation is going to work. So uh, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll sort of explain it. But basically, we don't make vitamin C, and nor do bats. Uh, well, there's a few that do, and nor do guinea pigs. That's how guinea pigs became experimental animals of, of, of choice. And no primates make vitamin C. And this got Linus Pauling very interested because here he had discovered this molecule, vitamin C, where 10 milligrams will stop you getting scurvy, and yet 100,000 milligram is really not toxic. He'd never seen that sort of versatility, even water, if you drink 10 liters in an hour, it can kill you. And what he found was that animals that make vitamin C, which is nearly all animals, make a lot. If I have a goat, my body weight, it will make 15 grams a day. One gram is 20 oranges worth. So, you know, we're looking at about 250 oranges worth. And here's the fascinating thing. If that goat gets exposed to a virus, it can increase its production of vitamin C up to 100 grams. So animals that make vitamin C, he noticed, uh, didn't really get cancer and very rarely got viral infections. So that's what got him interested for 39 years in studying vitamin C in relation to immunology, viruses, and also cancer. And this is a very good paper if you just want to get you know, totally up on the latest science by Professor Harry Hemmler. This is the one to read. It will really take you there. 
Now, there's a lot of myths about vitamin C, and one is that you just pee it out, that you can't absorb more than a very small amount. And by the way, if you pee anything out in your urine, it means you've absorbed it. So you can't both say you don't absorb it and you pee it out. And of course, you do pee it out in the same way that if I drink a liter of water, I'm going to effectively excrete a liter of water. The question is, what does it do in the meantime? So what we're looking at here in this chart down the bottom is the dose. Generally, up to about 500 milligrams a day, we are absorbing more and more and more. And above 500, the, the extra that you absorb is less. It does still go up, usually to about five grams, 5,000 milligrams. In a, for normal, healthy people, beyond that, there is no additional absorption into the bloodstream. The story is very different when you have an infection. Then you can absorb a lot more because you're using up a lot more. Now, one of the myths about vitamin C is that you should be getting it you know, from berries, rose hips, or whatever, and the synthetic stuff that you buy as a powder in the chemist uh, isn't as good. And this isn't true, because all animals make ascorbic acid. It's actually very, very similar to sugar. And sugar competes with ascorbic acid. And that, by the way, is why one of the major reasons that we have two thirds of deaths from COVID are actually men, uh, we have two thirds more men have diabetes and uh, sugar competes with ascorbic acid. These people are actually effectively much lower in ascorbic acid. So ascorbic acid is what animals make and it's what's made in a lab. We call it synthetic, but animals synthesize it in their body's chemistry. We synthesize it in a laboratory. And what's interesting if you look at this chart is if you take a 10 gram gulp of ascorbic acid, your blood level goes very high. The body knows how to get it straight in. Then it drops and no more is given. This is just a single dose. Then it goes up again, then it drops, then it goes up. Because vitamin C can not only extinguish an oxidant, think of smoking, for example, but it then gets recycled and reloaded and works again. The dotted line, by the way, is sodium ascorbate. So while ascorbic acid is slightly acidic, actually it's very acidic, about 2.5 on the pH scale, and above seven is alkaline. Sodium ascorbate is the alkaline version. Uh, it's good, it's fine, but it's probably not as good as ascorbic acid. And here's a very interesting thing. In this case, the dotted line is, is sodium ascorbate that's actually intravenous. So you've got a very nice steady increase if you, uh, if you inject sodium ascorbate, or usually it's in an infusion. But here again, we have a 10 gram gulp of ascorbic acid over 50 minutes. And you can really see how it goes in very high, dips up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. That is the recycling of vitamin C. You might have heard of liposomal vitamin C. And this is where the vitamin C is effectively wrapped in a type of fat, a phospholipid, and it does not get absorbed through the normal channels for vitamin C. And, uh, and therefore, you can get a little bit more in. So the black triangles are encapsulated liposomal vitamin C. And very often I say that if you take more vitamin C than you need, you get to the loose bowel level. So if you take a lot of vitamin C, especially when you don't have an infection, you can get loose bowels or diarrhea. And then you go down some. Now, if you happen to have an infection or a condition you want to treat with vitamin C, and you get up to that level with the regular ascorbic acid, and then you add on top the liposomal, you can actually get your blood level higher without having any of those problems. So we do know that intravenous vitamin C does go higher than oral. Now, I was talking today to what we hope uh, is, uh, is, is not the only one, but an ICU that's actually beginning to use injectable ascorbic acid. And this is a packet. You know when you have a drug packet and you look at the tiny print and uh, you can't you know, sort of read it without a, a magnifying glass? Well, in this case, what it actually says on the packet is there are no contraindications to the administration of ascorbic acid. I mean, when have you ever heard that for any drug? And the last sentence says, however, as much as six grams have been administered parenterally uh, to normal adults without evidence of toxicity. So you could certainly... Uh, inject or infuse six grams without any problem. You might have heard that in Wuhan, uh, which really got hit very, very hard by COVID, uh, some interesting things happened. And one of the things that they did at the hospital of uh, Zongnan, 
uh, under Dr. Peng was they started the first ever randomized placebo uh, controlled trial. And that was people who were seriously sick, probably going to die uh, in the ICU on a ventilator. Half of them were given 12 grams of vitamin C uh, infusion over four hours twice, so 24 grams a day, and the other half received a sterile water drip. And um, basically what happened, uh, the code has been broken now in the trial, so we know the results. And by the way, they had to end early, so they couldn't get the numbers that they needed to really have a sufficiently what we call powered trial. Um, and the reason that happened is they've run out of patients, they've, and that's with a TS on the end. The, they've had no one in ICU now for over three weeks. I mean, there's there's very, very, very few people left uh, in Wuhan, which is 11.1 million population uh, with anything to do with COVID. 35% died in the control group, 24% in the vitamin C group. Uh, that's basically one third less deaths. Uh, there was a very significant effect in those with the worst pulmonary function. There was a decrease in inflammatory markers. There was a decrease in the time needed on mechanical ventilators. So vitamin C does many things, but it's most known as an antioxidant. And what that means is that when you've got exhaust fume, if you like, from your own metabolism, and the cigarette smoke's a classic example because it's a trillion of these oxidants or free radicals, vitamin C can donate a spare electron and neutralize uh, this toxin. Uh, and fortunately, although it now becomes oxidized, it's called dehydroascorbic acid, ascorbate, it's, it's not particularly dangerous and it can be recycled. Now, uh, we don't want a chemistry class at this point, but what's, what I'm really showing you here is there's a whole range of nutrients from vitamin C, vitamin E, coenzyme Q, B vitamins like niacin, thiamine, selenium, uh, zinc, uh, you know, there's so many nutrients involved in oxidation and antioxidation. And I think the message I would like to say is that really all of nutrition is about this balance between antioxidants and oxidants. And I made this a little bit simpler in this chart. So what you can see is if you, for example, eat a French fry, um, which is an oxidant, burnt fat, vitamin E disarms it like a fireproof glove. Uh, the glove gets hot. It gets oxidized, vitamin E, it gets reloaded by CoQ10. Uh, vitamin C is reloaded particularly by alpha-lipoic acid. And glutathione, which is very rich in onions and garlic, is reloaded by anthocyanidines, rich in blue-red foods. So I decided when I hit 50, I'm going to supplement all of these. And that's what I do. I take vitamin C, I take a multi, but I also take an all-round antioxidant. So so, you know, if you like, every cog of the wheel can work. There's no point putting all your money just into, you know, one thing like resveratrol or glutathione or even just vitamin C. There's really a, a whole antioxidant to team players. And in terms of food, what that means is eating a very multicolored diet. Lots of mustard, lots of turmeric, lots of beetroot and butternut squash and asparagus and avocado and broccoli and kale and blueberries and black currants and, uh, you know, all these very, very strong colors. Because you can actually measure the oxygen, ox it's called the oxygen radical absorption capacity or ORAC. It, it's basically the antioxidant power of a food. And you can see that things like cinnamon, oregano, turmeric, mustard, blueberries, walnuts, pecans, uh, red lentils, red kidney beans, nice glass of red wine, um, all these very strong colors, dark chocolate as well, are very high in antioxidants. One of my favorites is um, the Montmorency cherry. It's phenomenally high. Um, one shot of this cherry concentrate has the same ORAC value as 103 carats. Now, that's a little bit about sort of the background of vitamin C, which we can come on to. Uh, vitamin D is important. By the way, I will say about, about vitamin C, that it's, it's by far the most critical in the process of a virus. Because what happens is, while I will take two grams of vitamin C a day, that is one gram twice a day, and that's pretty much what Linus Pauling worked out You know, we should be having. If I get a cold or flu, I'm going to take up to five grams immediately to get my blood level up, and then a gram an hour. And uh, if you do that, uh, I mean, if you look at the evidence for that, Half of people who do that do not have any symptoms within 24 hours. 
and I've been doing this for 40 years, I probably have had three colds or flu that have gone beyond 48 hours, but the majority will clear up within 24. Now, the other critical nutrient for your immune system is vitamin D. And all immune cells require vitamin D. They've all got receptors for vitamin D. We make it primarily in the sunshine. So by the time October, November comes along, your vitamin D levels are, are reducing. So you can see January, February, March, uh, very, very, very low levels for vitamin D. A lot of people in Britain, maybe a third, are deficient in vitamin D in the winter. Um, so where does flu actually occur? And the answer is effectively exactly those times. February is the biggest month of flu, but flu really happens between December and March and usually burns itself out in April. And if you put the vitamin D over the flu activity, you can see it's, it's pretty close. The other things we know is, you know, when it's very cold in the winter, you get more flu. When the winter uh, moisture, humidity is high, you get more. And uh, if you have lack of UV exposure like us, you get more. So there are a number of factors that make the winter the perfect storm. Once again, if you really want to get up to date on uh, vitamin D, uh, there's a study that literally came out. And in fact, uh, I got sent it before it came out. Uh, it's now out in, a, mag in, a, in, a, in a, a, a journal called Nutrients. So anyway, you'll have access to this. So if you want, this is the best and most up to date, literally published uh, you know, just, just a few days ago. Now, in relation to vitamin D and actual, uh, you know, pneumonia or, or serious illness, there are two studies that gave a very large amount. Now, if you go to the health food store and you buy some vitamin C drops, it's about a thousand IU. So here is a study of 30 people on mechanical ventilators, critically ill, given not a thousand IU, but 500,000 IU. And it worked. Uh, it absolutely worked and helped to reduce what we call the cytokine storm. Uh, another study in Georgia, U.S., gave people again, uh, well, 50,000 IU or 100,000 IU uh, daily for five days. So again, the top dose was 500,000 IUs. And it, it, in the top group, in the 500,000 IU, it reduced the number of days in hospital from 36 days down to 18 days. So in other words, it, it, it halved uh, the recovery time, which is very good. And blood levels really increased. So we know that if you can get your blood level above 100 nanomoles per liter, you're going to be in the best fighting form. And I wouldn't assume that you're there. Get your blood level checked, see where it is, and you'll learn what you need to do. Uh, people over 80 are producing about 80% less vitamin D in their skin. So we need to get outdoors get our kit off. We're designed to be naked, living outdoors, and a lot further south than, than the UK. Now, zinc is essential for the thymus. That was the gland in the base of your throat. It makes immune cells. It helps them function better. It's antiviral. It's very specifically antiviral. And we know that SARS-CoV-1, so now we're on to CoV-2, inhibit, inhibits zinc getting inside cells and killing them. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And this last line, clinical evidence of effectiveness in reducing duration by 33%. That relates very specifically to zinc lozenges. Now, I want to get about 15 milligrams of zinc a day, but here we have five trials giving 80 to 90 milligrams of zinc, which is usually six lozenges uh, taken over the day, and it's, it's effective. It reduces cold duration by 33%. They don't taste very nice because zinc's quite metallic, um, but and also what we've learned is there's no benefit in going above 100 milligrams of zinc. In fact, it might even be harmful. So somewhere between 50 and 100 milligrams of zinc is profoundly antiviral. We don't need that normally. 15 milligrams, maybe a maximum of 20 is good. You've been hearing about a drug called hydroxychloroquine, uh, which is all part of the quinine uh, that, that is anti-malarial. And I think one of the reasons that this drug is actually being attacked is because it's off patent and very, very cheap. It does work. It's not a miracle, but it does work. It does have side effects. You may know that the quinine, uh, when all those African um, hunters uh, used to drink their gin and tonic, you know, it wasn't the gin that did them in, it was the tonic that made their liver chronic. So long-term chloroquine definitely has side effects. But what's interesting 
is that it actually carries zinc into viruses and the zinc kills the virus. Something else that carries zinc into viruses is quercetin. Red onions are exquisitely high in it. They have 20 milligrams. But when, I, when I'm treating somebody, I want to give them 500 milligrams of quercetin. So we're looking at you know, 25 uh, red onions. So quercetin is very interesting. And there's, this is a very good paper if you wanted to study the role of quercetin. It's actually being used uh, in some hospitals and ICUs in America. Now, my book, uh, Flu Fighters, uh, when, when this all started, I locked myself away and I wrote it. It's 160 pages. It's uh, 161 uh, references. And the last chapter uh, contains information that can save lives. So I'm giving it away for free at flufighters.net. Please download it. Please circulate it to as many as many people as possible. What I'm showing you now is every week I get a report from the Intensive Care National Audit and Research Center in Britain. And to give you an example, this came in this weekend. Uh, the average age of COVID patients is 60. It's comparing it to viral pneumonia over the last two years. So relatively similar age. But look at the sex differences. While normally with viral pneumonia, it's pretty even in the sexes, what we're seeing with COVID is it's massively skewed to men, 27% women, 73% men. And I think part of that is this big increase in diabetes, but there are other factors um, as well. Very, very rare in pregnant women. So we can see that in viral pneumonia, it's 1.8% of, of people of, of pregnant women. It's very low, very rare for a pregnant women. They do get uh, you know, serious uh, uh, COVID-19, ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And it's really unheard of in children under the age of nine. Or I should perhaps say healthy children. We had a child age five who died in Britain, but they had other health complications that haven't been disclosed. But if you look on Worldometer, there is not a single death in a child under nine. One of the strong theories as to why that is, is that children produce a lot of melatonin. And melatonin is also produced by pregnant women increasingly as they go through the trimester. So melatonin actually acts as an antioxidant and may be protected. Now, this is interesting, just for you to know. We have 34 out of 285 IC units in Britain are empty. They have no patients with COVID. That is up to last weekend. And the Nightingale, which was built uh, to, to have a capacity of 3,000, actually only has 19 people in it at this point in time. Now, here's the thing I, I hate to show you because I was uh, you know, with an I, ICU group now. Uh, but what you're, uh, yeah, we, not, these things aren't quite working, but basically the bad news is that once people are on respiratory support, 67.4% uh, in Britain are coming out dead. That's what's happening. Uh, and overall, the survival once you're in ICU is 47%. Is uh, this is very, very bad. And it's very, very sad. And if you look on Worldometer and you look at deaths versus recovered, and on the right-hand side, you can see the survival rate. I mean, we are the worst. So when you get down to China and Korea and Germany, where 95, 96, 97% of people are surviving, uh, at least on Worldometer data, it's 2%. I mean, it's not good. And of course, there'll be some jiggles in the statistics, but we're doing really badly. So what actually happens when someone gets seriously infected? Because many people, the majority, I mean, at least 80 uh, percent, you know, will have a minor infection and be fine. So as I showed you earlier, that iron gets knocked out of hemoglobin, sets up a chain reaction of oxidation, think rust. Now the liver has to work really hard to make a container for that damaging iron, which is called ferritin. So blood ferritin rises. Now cells uh, uh, starved of vitamin C can't make nitric oxide. Viagra, for example, is a drug that stimulates uh, a vascular flow. Uh, that's what nitric oxide is about. That puts the stress on the cardiovascular system. Your oxygen plummets. You don't have hemoglobin delivering a good oxygen. Ultimately, you need ventilators. And then this triggers a cytokine storm where your whole immune system overreacts, your white cell count shoots up, uh, you go into a state of massive inflammation. And, uh, you know, this is really what, what causes death. What happens is you need your fight-flight syndrome. You need cortisol, the adrenal hormone. And once your, your body stops fighting and isn't producing cortisol, you die. That's basically what happens. And everything described here is reversed by ascorbic acid uh, plus 
cortisol. Uh, this is a winner. Uh, I'm going to show you doctors who have zero deaths, and they're using the combination of ascorbic acid with cortisol, and some of them are giving zinc, and some are giving hydroxychloroquine or quercetin, which activate the zinc. So in America, we've now got a team of, uh, well, it, it started out as eight, but it's growing very rapidly, um, of, uh, of, uh, of practitioners. Here we have the Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Working Group. Today, I've been interviewing these people. Uh, for example, I said, Paul Marks just had a week in ICU. I said, how many out, how many dead? He said, 30, released, no deaths. And I asked Joseph Barron, how about you? He said, 24, in and out, no deaths. So many of these doctors are reporting absolutely no deaths. And they've made a film about this, which you can obviously get the details when you revisit this, covid19criticalcare.com. With the right strategy, people do not need to die. Black elderberry is, is very nice, and there's two good studies that show that it definitely does help when you have cold or flu. Uh, it, it reduces the duration of symptoms. Uh, these were very good studies. They're very, very solid. Um, I, however, I wouldn't use it in an intense situation. Uh, for reasons we could always talk about. So if you start to look at all the things you want to optimize T cells and function, to optimize macrophage, to optimize interferon, to inhibit hemoglobin, uramidase, viral replication, to strengthen the gap between cells, to reduce the cytokine storm, to produce more antibodies, reduce oxidative stress, you're seeing all the nutrients that I've been talking about. This isn't like a nice add-on. This is the absolute core, the absolute center of treating this uh, condition, this viral condition. And as a consequence, uh, you get these improved cellular actions. That's less colds and flu, less viral and respiratory infections. That's been proven in controlled trials with vitamin C, but only once you get above six grams. Vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin A. You get shorter colds and flu with vitamin C, elderberry, zinc, Aged garlic is also good, and less severe symptoms with vitamin C, elderberry, ginger, and aged garlic. Of course, there are a whole lot of other uh, phytonutrients that will have a function, but I'm keeping it brief. So this looks like a little commercial, and in a way it is, but it also explains how my mind works. So I've got a vitamin C tablet that is almost 1,000 milligrams. It's got a little black elderberry in there, a little ginger, which is a fantastic anti-inflammatory, Bilberry, which is the highest ORAC score of all the berries, it's blueberry really, and, uh, and zinc. And zinc three milligram is very little. But if I take one of these an hour, which is what I do if I get a cold, so if I take 20 in a day, if I've got a serious flu, then I'm getting 20 times three, I'm getting 60 milligrams of zinc. And that's the kind of really powerful level. Some of the people that I work with, for example, in cancer, uh, for certain cancers, you want to get the blood vitamin C very high. I've got some clients who are taking 40 grams a day without any loose bowels. Uh, that's their bowel tolerance. And I like to use, in that case, a balance between ascorbic acid, which is acidic, it works very well, and the ascorbates, which are a bit more alkaline. And I also want to work it out so it's going to get enough zinc and enough magnesium. If we had more time, I would talk about that. So in the book, I go through all these amazing immune power foods. And of course, the people who are dying are overweight, usually with darker skin. And that's not a racist comment. You just make less vitamin D. Very often, male diabetics, you know, who have a bad diet. And they already are starting from a very, very low point. Just a couple of uh, hot tips. If you've got a juicer, juice a whole lot of ginger. If you don't have a juicer, find someone who does and come home with a nice big bottle of ginger juice, put it in ice cube trays. So you've always got it on hand. Do the same thing with lemon or lime juice. So if you ever do have a, a sore throat, pop a couple of ginger cubes, a lime juice cube, um, pour in some hot water, a little bit of honey or agave. You can add vitamin C as well. It's not destroyed by hot water. Watermelon juice is fantastic, but buy a seeded watermelon uh, because you want the seeds and whiz them up in your Nutribullet it's very, very good. Other favorites like carrot, ginger, apple juice, cherry active, blueberry active, I mentioned as well. Again, you can add vitamin C in. So the book is Flu Fighters. It comes out today, uh, actually. And uh, I, I, it took me um, a little over two weeks to write. 
and about two weeks to print. Uh, so it's very there. If you go on fluefighters.net, there's a ton of useful reports and resources. I'm doing weekly podcasts with all the top scientists, including Professor Paul Marek, who really is leading the fight in America to have zero deaths. And also there's a list of all the references that you can click on and go straight to the study. Uh, we've started a campaign, which is called uh, change.org slash vitamin C for UK. Uh, this is Linus Pauling. He said all this 40 years ago, and he knew that vitamin C was a profound antiviral agent. And now is the time where this very inexpensive, unpatentable, hence unprofitable, and safe and natural medicine really needs to come to the fore. I was delighted uh, to meet uh, Charlotte, and uh, she's talking next, and her fantastic uh, initiative. Uh, she has a sort of broad uh, natural healthcare uh, background, knows a lot more about herbs and other such things than I do. And she was impassioned uh, to set up a delivery service to give our frontline NHS workers the nutrients that they need to stay fit and strong. So I'm going to stop now and uh, hand over to Charlotte. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick. I so enjoyed your talk. So much knowledge there. I'm going to make notes and a go back and listen to it. Thank you. So um, I'm just going to speak a little bit about this NHS um, immune support initiative that I sent out on um, set up for the frontline workers in the UK, how it came about. Um, the beginning of March, um, in my own practice, uh, a lot of frontline workers were coming to me as clients, um, wanting to create um, immune protective plans for themselves because they knew they were vulnerable, being on the receiving end of a very high viral load in their workplace. And some um, NHS clients were coming to me because they were suffering from very acute symptoms, very high fevers, coughs. Um, they, they felt that they'd come down with the COVID virus and were needing my assistance. And so I put them on a, a certain type of protocol. Um, a lot of what you heard um, in Patrick's talk involved um, high dosing on vitamin C and um, taking zinc and D. And other things I included was something called andrographis, which is a well-known herb in Chinese medicine and in Ayurveda. It's been used for millennia and recently in the last few decades, specifically for the COVID family of viruses, it stops re replication and is very effective. And the other thing I was um, recommending people was like a medicinal mushroom mix with reishi and turkey tail and cordyceps because um, medicinal mushrooms are very good for boosting immunity and um, reducing inflammation. And there's been a lot of research over the years into their amazing effect. So I was um, recommending um, these two um, people, especially uh, the high dosing of the vitamin C. And most of these frontline workers were literally their symptoms reduced by 90% in 24 hours. And they are very amazed. And from massive fevers to the next day, fevers broken, they can go in their garden and kind of feel pretty normal. And within two days, you know, the symptoms have radically shifted and they're feeling pretty much back to normal. And a lot of them said to me, why don't we have this available to us? It's bonkers. Why, why, why don't we have this immune support? And, um, and I said, yeah, why don't you? <laughs> like, especially the vitamin C, it's like a no brainer and it's very sad. And it's really due to my um, experience, lack of education in the current um, situation in the world. And so I felt impassioned to like, let's make this available to the NHS frontline workers. A lot of people wanting to support the NHS. This is one way to support the NHS from the inside out, you know, PPE, you know, everyone's talking about that is, you know, highly essential to have that protection on the outside, especially when you're on the receiving end um, of the high viral load in the workplace. But it doesn't actually deal with the whole viral load because your body has to deal with it, actually. And um, so I thought, let's also provide that protection from the inside out with um, giving them the best possible immune supportive products. And... Um, that are on the market to help mop up the viral load that they're on the receiving end and giving the best possible position to feel resilient and strong. Um, both as, should we say, protection, but also if they were to come down with symptoms that they would have on hand, the, some of the best vitamin C in the liposomal form and all the other um, 
um, supplements that I just mentioned, that they had them on hand and they could take them at different dosages according to um, if they had um, acute or mild symptoms. So um, they can utilize it for protection and for, you know, helping assist one to heal with ease. So that's how it um, kind of came to be. And it really has been a grassroots effort where people, um, so how it works is if you're in the NHS, um, people um, email in to, uh, the, the email address is love.nhslove at gmail.com, that's it, okay. And um, they just uh, send their postal address of where they want their immune support um, pack to be sent and uh, an ID, so we know that they're definitely working um, at the NHS, and that's it. And um, they received this immune pack in the post. And um, we've had amazing responses. People have felt like so supportive, obviously, both from a physical aspect, but they felt like deeply emotionally touched. People talk about emotional immunity because often with these things, especially like the vitamin C, it's really great for ad your adrenal glands and you know your stress levels as well, especially the mushrooms. It's great for um, helping calm the nervous system down. It's a great tonic. So yeah, it's helping the physical immunity, but it's emotional and mental immunity as well. Um, and so, yeah, that's essentially it in a nutshell. And um, so Part of this initiative is um, we, we set up a crowdfunder and every penny that is um, raised goes directly into paying for the products which go into these packs. And the beautiful thing is all the suppliers which have got, got behind it are like um, slashing their prices down to like 70%, sometimes even more in support of the NHS, which they wouldn't do for wholesale suppliers. So we're able to um, supply a lot of these NHS workers. And um, to give you an idea of figures, like normal retail price for all these very high quality supplements, usually for a month's supply is 110 pounds if you have to buy it all. But we've brought it down to 15 pounds, so it's a radical difference. And we're giving each NHS worker three months supply. And um, so, yeah, um, there might be a, a web link to where you can donate. So um, that's it, nhsimmunesupport.com. So yeah, just click on that link and, you know, every little bit counts, you know, even if it's just one pound, imagine if thousands of us just gave one pound or five or wh whatever you can afford. And it really goes directly into these medicines. So know that you are giving these medicines, these natural medicines to NHS workers. And I, I see it as... Medicine is supporting medicine, you know, and it's a beautiful way in, in, in which natural healthcare can join together in this time to support allopathic medicine. And that's where I'd like to come into introducing um, Dr. Claire Relton, who's with us today. I want to introduce how we came to work together. So thank you, Claire, for joining us. So um, in the middle of setting up um, the NHS Support Initiative, um, a friend of mine who's a doctor said, you know, this is quite an extraordinary, um, you know, um, experience that um, you've set up, Charlotte. Um, it really should um, be turned into medical research. You should try and, you know, um, extract the most um, amount of information that you can. As, as we know, data and statistics is very important in helping bring about change in the world. And thankfully, I was introduced to Dr. Claire Relton, um, who is been able to provide us um, with a study which NHS workers are signing up to who are receiving these immune, immune packs. And so I'll let her tell you a little bit more about all of this. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Patrick. And thank you, Charlotte. And what, what a great initiative. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Claire Elton. I'm a senior lecturer in clinical trials at Queen Mary University, London. My background actually is complementary in alternative medicine. I spent uh, 15 years as a homeopath. Um, but the last 15 years, I've actually been a researcher uh, uh, training and uh, designing trials of, of interventions to improve health. Um, and I've always been very interested in the fact um, of what types of interventions are actually provided in the NHS and then compared that with what types of interventions I actually know the public are taking. Um, and I think there's, a, there's an amazing gap. So I've always been interested in, in working out, well, what's really happening, not just what's happening in terms of what's being pushed out through the mainstream. So um, when the COVID started, I thought, OK, now is the time to start something called a UK national health study. Let's really listen to what people are doing. Let, let's listen to something other than the mortality statistics and the uh, infectious and the, and the COVID um, 
um, infectious infection rates. Let's actually listen to what the public's doing. We've got 65 and a half million people out there who are um, vulnerable to this, uh, to COVID and uh, whatever comes beyond in varying degrees. And let's actually listen to what they're doing, spot trends, see what vitamin, what's actually happening with vitamin C and vitamin D and vitamin and the zincs, etc. cetera, uh, and what people are doing with their diets, what types of services are people getting? Are they actually going and seeing complementary and alternative medicine practitioners? What types of mainstream practitioners are using? And what's their COVID status? What's their health-related quality of life? What's their long-term conditions? Do they have, as Patrick said, do they have diabetes? Let's actually try and look at the, the long-term patterns by listening to the general public. At the moment, what we know, uh, how the government is managing the, the, the current crisis is they're saying, stay at home, um, uh, stay away from people. But actually, there's much, much more we can do. So uh, we set up something called Health Hawk. We've designed a, an outcome measure, a tool for measuring, for listening to the, the UK public um, called VHawk, Virus Health and Wellbeing Checker. Um, and it's an online tool um, which practitioners can get their patients to uh, subscribe to, or you can actually, just as a member of the public, you can fill it in. So if you go to www.hawk.health, you can see the survey. So I was delighted when Charlotte contacted me and I thought, wow, what an amazing initiative. Let's actually get some data rather than it just be anecdotes and anecdotes, as we know, just eventually get lost and trodden into the mud. Let's actually get some hard numbers some figures and actually see how what the status of these NHS, NHS frontline staff are before they get these packs. And let's say, see how they are in the weeks and months uh, over the next year. So, uh, so Charlotte's been recruiting people who are receiving the packs and saying, please fill in the, this outcome measure via the practitioner platform that we've got. And we're now starting to gather data, which is really exciting. So in the coming weeks and months, we'll actually be able to have some hard data on the impact on people's lives of this immune support. So I'm absolutely delighted. So uh, I'm very happy to take questions from anybody um, about where we go from here. Um, I think you had some interesting questions, uh, uh, Josh, Josh, didn't you? So. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's amazing. Uh, and Charlotte, um, great to see you working in this sphere. Normally, um, when I see you, we're in a field listening to loud music. So uh, yeah. it's, it's good to be talking about this as well. Um, and it, it's really fascinating. One question that I did have was, um, why has it taken the NHS so long to uh, to bring in um, these kind of therapies? Is it a lack of evidence, a lack of trials? Um, and, and how can we um, speed this process up? Well, well it, sorry, I'll it leave it to you, yes. It has it. I mean, you know, the mainstream is the mainstream and uh, complementary and alternative medicine is continually derided in the press and the media uh, in varying degrees. Yet we know that 10% of people visit a complementary and alternative medicine practitioner um, every year and uh, almost everybody has homeopathic medicines like Arnica and Calendula in their, in their cupboards. Um, so it's, uh, it's fascinating. So the, reason, the, the reasons why uh, the interventions that are uh, pushed out through the NHS are the ones that they are is a very, very fascinating. And I can't <laughs> probably take several programs to dissect it. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the um, uh, tradition and profit and uh, uh, some of the things. So what we need to do is go back to the people and actually listen to what people are doing and think about the simple things that we can do instantly, which is to improve our health, which is to eat really good food, to eat lots of fresh fruit and veg, uh, to breastfeed our children, to have lots of exercise and fresh air, uh, to be kind and loving to each other. So these are things which you can't uh, put in a bottle, uh, that you can't actually um, uh, take to market, that are very difficult to run placebo randomized control trials of. And the evidence-based, there's something called the evidence-based medicine hierarchy, where um, uh, observational data is regarded as very low quality and double-blind randomized control trials and systematic reviews and meta-analyses of randomized control trials are seen at the top of the hierarchy. But to get to the get to the hot top of the hierarchy, you have to conduct trials, randomized control trials, and randomized control trials traditionally cost one to two to three million pounds each to conduct. Um, so you have your answer as to yeah. why 
yeah. things like fresh fruit and veg, we don't have the randomized control trials. On. I don't and think we're in this I, urgent situation where we need this evidence as quickly as possible. Uh, Patrick, what's your perspective? Uh, it's very this? simple. I, I've been in this for 40 years looking at it. It's simply down to greed and ignorance, those two things, nothing else. Um, the ignorance is a function of the greed as well, by the way. A doctor will get 10 minutes of nutrition. A friend of mine was recently training at Oxford University Medical School. At the end of their diabetes lecture, they got seven minutes. And the lecturer said, that is all the nutrition you're going to get. So if I want to know what drug to take, I will ask a doctor. If I want to know what foods to eat, I will not ask a doctor because they don't know. So there is ignorance. But behind that is money. It's just money. I mean, it's quite obscene because when Claire talks about the hierarchy of evidence, we have meta-analyses, systematic reviews. We have uh, studies showing that vitamin C reduces pneumonia, speeds up recovery. We have all that. I mean, there isn't a single drug on the World Health Organization's list of allowed drugs to experiment with during COVID-19 that has a fraction of the evidence that exists and has existed for quite some time on vitamin C. And Patrick, yeah. I'm quite keen to ask you about yeah. specifically yeah. Uh, your optimism now that the NHS yeah. might start adopting uh, some of these supplements and, and this way of treating people. Yeah, I think they're going to have to. I, I mean, there are a few cracks appearing. There are some people who are really interested. But the embarrassing thing is, you know, we look over at China and see they ship 50, on February the 2nd, they ship 50 tonnes of ascorbic acid into Wuhan. That's 50 million grams. They gave every hospital patient, uh, sorry, every hospital worker, just like Charlotte is doing, two grams a day. They gave every hospital patient at least six grams up to 24 grams. They gave every ICU patient intravenous vitamin C. This is being ignored, but it was reported to the WHO. So that's going on. In America, we're going to hear more and more people who have zero death rate. And we are appallingly behind. And it's becoming embarrassingly obvious. And I think that one thing that may come out of this COVID-19 situation is everyone is thinking about nutrition and their health and their diet and everything else. I mean, vitamin C sales have just gone ballistic. So the public know, the only people who don't know right now uh, really is the NHS and the government. And you have to ask, why is that? When you see, like this weekend, a double-page spread on vitamin D, fantastic. It's very good, but it's a soft target. You know, it's like saying, eat a well-balanced diet, do some exercise. The real threat right now um, to medicine is things like non-patentable cheap vitamin C. See, the point is, if you had, if you had the means to not have anyone die in ICU, what does that do for the vaccine story? You know, how imperative is it to have a vaccine if you're dealing with, yesterday, 800 people were diagnosed with diabetes. Yesterday, 800 people were diagnosed with dementia. Yesterday, 800 people died uh, from COVID-19. So all of these share one fundamental, you know, background, and it comes back to nutrition. The NHS is the fastest growing failing business in Britain. And it will just cost more and more and more. Nothing is going to change. Not having more money for studies, not having more studies. Nothing will change in medicine until nutrition and, and is absolutely the first point of medicine. Patrick, by, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm conscious of time. Um, yeah. We've got a question, I think, <laughs> Zach. Um, I'd love to know what the daily diet and supplement regimes are for the three presenters and if they have recommendations on how to make sure you're buying good quality. Okay, that's a great question. Thank you, Megan. Um, Patrick, uh, would you like to All take right. that? I, and also, I just want to, what I was saying before, I have a fr wonderful friend. He, he's died now. Acupuncturist, homeopath, herbalist, uh, osteopath, absolutely star fellow, Joseph Goodman. Some might even remember him and a vegetarian campaign, all sorts of things. He still, when he gave his lectures, said the fundamental is nutrition. You know, that has to be got right. So, well, it varies every day. So this morning I had soaked oats with some grated apple and some chia seeds and some almond. I actually started at five in the morning and I'll end at 10 and I've been doing that for a month. It's not healthy, but there is so much going on. And then um, for dinner, I had a wonderful um, lentil curry 
uh, with a little bit of uh, a fish in it. I'm not quite sure what it was, a white fish. My wife made it, it was very nice with some brown rice. I had half an apple and, um, and I had a scoop of some vegan ice cream and I'm kind of looking forward to a glass of wine when this is all over. And, and do you take supplements every day? Yes, I take a multivitamin, a vitamin C, uh, essential omegas, that is omega-3 and a little bit of six, and I take an antioxidant. So I take four pills twice a day. And apart from plugging your own products, how do you know that they're good quality? Well, I mean, a lot of the, you know, the Solgar and the BioCare and the, you know, the decent companies. I mean, to be honest, I've formulated a lot of the products for a lot of the companies uh, just to raise the <laughs> level. So it doesn't matter. Higher nature, you know, whatever. But you always want a high strength multivitamin. So forget about the ones that talk about RDA because that, that's mm. really useless. And you always want one that is not a one a day. It says you take two a day because you can't get enough in a multivitamin and mineral in one a day. So um, and good multi, good vitamin C, good essential omegas. If you're a little older in life, it might be worth having extra antioxidants. Charlotte, it's going to bring you in on this as well. We, we are slightly running out of time. We're going to go over a little bit. Um, okay. Charlotte, do you, do you have uh, regular, regular supplements every day? Um, they kind of vary because obviously we're in COVID times and I'm in London. So, yeah, more of a viral load around. So I am really aware of my vitamin C levels, to be honest. I'm definitely taking two grams of um, the liposomal vitamin C. And um, I'm also taking homeopathy because I'm finding, that especially around this pandemic, there's a very, should we say, huge emotional charge of panic and fear. And actually when you get, if you are to come down with the COVID virus, it really just really concentrates on your chest and your lung, lung area. And so when you can't breathe, you're going to panic more. So this is a very strong connection with panic and fear. So in homeopathy, it really helps, uh, uh, should we say, assist and um, deal with that panic and fear. So for me, I, I do like when I feel like this sort of panic come on, um, which, you know, is really part of the collective right now. We're in this collective soup of it. I do like to reach out for my aconite. Um, which is a homeopathic remedy, and also arsenicum. Those are, the, for me, right now, the two remedies of their time for, like, the panic and, and the fear. And so today I was feeling a bit rough. I was like, ooh, you know, that sort of emotional panic and tightness in my chest. And, I, I, you know, I took one of those each, and, yeah. So I, I like having that around. Great. And um, I do the zinc, and I do my mushrooms, like my medicinal mushroom tea, for sure. Yeah. Great. Well, that sounds like some great ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I've got one thought has just come into my head about um, this idea of a trial. And I wonder, uh, with Medicine Festival happening at the end of August this year, um, and we're hoping, you know, 1,500 people, maybe 2,000 people will come to that event uh, subject to corona, uh, whether there might be a way of bringing some form of a trial, maybe a vitamin C group, a placebo group, and uh, and, and potentially a control um, into that environment. It, would that be possible? We could have an active experiment going on for the festival? I think that's a great Absolutely. idea. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's an amazing idea. I think wherever there's uncertainty, wherever there's questions that we want to answer, we should conduct randomized trials and let's have a people's trial at the, at the medicine festival. Absolutely. Love it. And in case you didn't know, when we want to test something like vitamin C or zinc or something on immune, on colds, uh, we do it on marathon runners um, because, because marathon runners very, very often after a marathon, they've overexerted, they come down with colds. So they're the prime target. And we're going to be dancing like bell ends yeah, for, like, you know, for five days. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's perfect. Yeah, definitely. And out of interest, Claire, um, it, on a study like that, what would you be hoping to achieve? You'd, you'd have maybe uh, 100 people or 200 people, or is the more people, the, the better? The more, more the better. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. The more the better, yes. I mean, why not? Because uh, the, the more people you have in your study, the more power you have, uh, the more... Uh, the more powerful the answers are that you can produce. So yes, and you've I, got and I, and I guess people going randomly into two or three groups. <laughs> yeah, and there's going to be a huge question with these large events as to as to whether they are going to be able to go ahead anyway. Um, and I guess you know if these protocols were successful, uh, then what a brilliant way of of enabling things to happen in the future. Uh, so it could be a winner. Let's talk about that off offline. Um, okay. Zach, have we got any other questions coming in? 
By the way, while you're looking, two things I found in China. One is the doctors there think the virus has mutated. So in the very early stages, they were seeing people instantly, multi-organ failure, really, really sick. And that just has not been happening lately. So they think it may have changed, which is exactly what happens in a lot of uh, uh, viral epidemics. And the second thing is they've antibody tested everyone, you know, all the hospital workers, all the patients and all their families. And they track who they meet. And what they found is that 1% of people who test antibody positive uh, were completely asymptomatic. So you may be antibody positive and you just don't even know it. And what was interesting is that none of these people uh, went on to infect anyone else. So the testing, the testing is essential. Um, yeah. Thanks, guys. And thanks, Claire. Thanks, Charlotte. Thanks, Patrick. What a really informative, incredible session this was. Uh, and I'm sure will be really fun, useful for everybody who gets to see it and who's watched it this evening. Um, just to say, from our perspective uh, at Medicine, looking forward to the next one. Zach will give a bit of detail about that in a minute. Um, and, um, you know, it, we're excited about the possibility of holding the event. But again, we're just cautious with regards to Corona. Uh, and so we won't be able to kind of announce anything uh, with complete certainty for a while. But what I would say is that this event is a very new concept and a very, um, a very interesting one. It's very different to most other festivals, probably almost any other festivals, in that it's a non-profit and we are uh, really doing it to protect uh, indigenous rights uh, and to bring people into close connection with nature. Uh, and so if it doesn't happen this year, we hope that next year um, it will, um, but we're obviously hoping that it will happen this year. So anybody who buys a ticket for this event is supporting this enterprise and, and every penny that is made that is a profit will go straight into protecting indigenous culture. We think that indigenous culture is very important, controlling 80% of the rainforests of, of the world uh, or protecting 80% of the rainforests. And so would um, would would strongly uh, hope that we'll be able to, to bring as much awareness to this as possible. Um, so uh, if you are interested in coming and supporting this enterprise, please go to the website uh, www.medicinefestival.com um, and, and join this, this um, incredible journey that we're on, uh, especially in the face of Corona. Uh, thanks for watching all of this. Zach, I'm going to hand over back to you. Uh, and thanks again, Patrick, Charlotte and Claire. Thank you, Joss. Yeah, and uh, and thank you guys for so much information. As many, many people commented um, on our feeds, I need to go back through that and make notes. Um, but I'm feeling super well informed and uh, equipped to prepare myself and my immune system moving forward in the face of Corona. Um, so thank you guys. I hope everyone enjoyed. Um, this was a one-off Thursday session, but we are considering the possibility of doing some more, whether that'll be bi-weekly or monthly is to be decided, um, but please stay tuned. We're still running every single Sunday um, for the next three, four months until the festival likely. Um, so coming up this Sunday on the 26th of April uh, at 8 p.m., as always, we have Berg joining us. Uh, Berg is an internationally renowned med meditation teacher and an author. He's taught thousands of different students uh, over the past 22 years, and he's actually trained as a monk. He's got a really amazing understanding of kind of Buddhist teachings of meditation, but also healing, energy work, and kind of functioning consciousness perspectives and whatnot too. So he's going to do a really insightful talk on the pathway back to integrity and how we should be responding to what's happening now, more broadly in regards to our perspective as opposed to our health. Um, so he's also doing a 24-hour loving kindness meditation, which is called a Metathon. It starts at 12 p.m. on Saturday and ends 12 p.m. Sunday. Um, a bunch of our medicine council and team will be tuning in, um, and then following the end of that Metathon, he'll be coming on to do a talk with us. So please come along. As, as Josh said, I won't repeat too much, but you know we are keeping an eye on global developments and government decisions and advice from health experts in regards to whether we can continue with Medicine Festival, but we're super grateful for all the support and tickets purchased. Um, worst case, they'll be continued on to next year, or you can have your name changed and we'll be running an online festival um, regardless. So thank you all so much for taking the time to tune in. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all on Sunday evening. And that's all from us. And I'm going to teach you my Kung, Kung Flu technique. <laughs> <laughs> Kung Flu. Check it out. <laughs>